Hello guys, welcome back to the Sean Wood All Good Podcast. As you've probably noticed, we have video now. It's not gonna be every episode yet, but I'll eventually transition to having video in every episode. I have a really fun episode for you today. I have my good friend, fellow Sydney starter, Dominic Di Tommaso on the podcast. Um, and we're gonna talk about his three favorite parkour spots. Actually, I think it was four parkour spots around the world. There's probably not many other people as qualified as Dom in the parkour community to talk about this subject. He's probably covered more ground than any other person. And uh, I'm just gonna jump straight into it. So here is another episode, Sean Wood, All Good Podcast. You. So we've had a little bit of a problem. We've had to walk a, a bit around the city uh, to try and find somewhere because we've got this super gorilla style podcast set up. <laughs> and we're on top of a roof in- the Exhibition Center. At right? the Exhibition Center. Yeah. Still not sure how this audio is gonna be. But we're going to rock it off with a podcast with my man, Dom. Um, what have you been up to, bro? I have been traveling. What can you talk about <laughs> that you've been up to? Because I don't even know if all of it is talkable. Uh, I think everything's pretty pretty okay to speak about. I just can't really uh, be posting pictures and content online from certain things. But um, the last six weeks, I've been traveling around basically going to Art of Motion, doing my own training, getting a bit of holiday time in with the missus, and... Who's just behind the camera, she's a, a camera woman right now, or... Yeah. Sub-camera woman. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also just, uh, uh, big news for me was getting a role in a feature film. That is something I'd like to talk about briefly. Yeah. Are you allowed to mention the film name? Uh, the, the name of the movie is Twist. Yeah. Should be coming out, I believe, next uh, spring sometime. So spring European season's not out. So May, June, maybe a little bit before, like April, May. Oh, we've got a helicopter coming over right now. So if you're watching audio-only version or listening to audio, we're sorry, we're on a rooftop and it's a bit noisy. Yeah. So, <laughs> the big acting debut. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a really, really amazing opportunity I uh, got put as a speaking role in a film the character does parkour he's a thief uh, it, I get to open the film with my role um, and it's a big big name cast as well like Michael Caine, Rita Ora, Lena Haiti, uh, Jude Law's son Raph Law, uh, Franz Derman who's in quite a few uh, renowned TV series so it was uh, a really like felt like a larger than world experience uh, and you know a lot of cool days on set and the director himself was really enthusiastic and I felt like I made a lot of nice uh, you know friendships that hopefully will blossom into more things so is this something that you're considering doing more of uh, I personally would love to I, I actually before parkour I was doing performing arts full-time like I grew up doing stage work and uh, theater shows and TV and movie acting and stuff like that so I did kind of have a passion for it when I was younger, but then I found jumps and was like, you know what, this is way easier. I can just go out, do some jumps and be content. Yeah. So now I'm, now the inspiration or opportunity for both has arisen. I'm really keen to try and take a bite of that apple. Well, it's something that I've, I've, I mean, we've spoken about a little bit before and I'm super passionate about is parkour being used as a tool, right? So I don't think the necess it necessarily always has to be just like you become an athlete and there's just one path and you've done that and you've done that really well but I think there's a lot of opportunity for parkour as a creative tool to be used and build on top of like other sort of artistic disciplines whether it be acting um, and I really truly believe that at some point in the next 10 years next decade there's going to be somebody that will be a household name as an actor who comes from a, a parkour background absolutely I mean it also one of the things it creates is this confidence in your character and in yourself to have the abilities to do those things and that's what a lot of actors have from the from the get-go is that self-confidence to push themselves out there in a uh i guess exposed way in, in many ways yeah. not just like exposed physically but also emotionally or who they are or putting effort into something acting a lot of people find it hard to commit 100 percent without being seen as cheesy or you know what i mean to be heavily involved in that world and to actually fully commit to your role it takes a lot of guts yeah, yeah, and, yeah and parkour teaches a lot of people confidence for that sort of thing i did see that tom holland the guy that played the new spider-man i saw an interview with him as well and apparently like he was like a little english free runner um prior to getting the spider-man role well i'd heard uh, i'd heard that he'd done a, a bunch of stuff i don't know how tight-knit with the community he was before kind of blowing up or anything like that but 
I know that he has a very high skilled athletic background and mm. have seen him like you know on videos doing a lot of the the stunts or no, I wouldn't even say stunts just parkour and free running esque stuff acrobatics and like in an urban environment as well which is amazing to see someone of that uh, you know household, sort household of, yeah. credibility with acting be that skilled in a physical discipline well it kind of shows it just speaks testaments of like how widespread parkour as a discipline is now like and it's sort of breaking into that mainstream slowly yeah um, well twist itself will feature quite a lot of parkour and the actors themselves actually underwent quite a bit of training uh, physically for the roles like I know Raf himself was training with Seb Fukan what? for a month leading into the role because his role requires quite a lot of like gaps and jumps and Ryan Doyle was his stunt double on on set and was saying how impressive Raf's skills for you know the physical side of things were and that he hasn't had to step in near as much as he thought he would have had to initially because the actors are taking on the initiative of learning these skills all right let's hold up ryan doyle <laughs> what's that guy up to ryan doyle uh, as far as i know he's still uh you know uh working with airborne academy in liverpool he wants to host a pro jam in 2020 Sick. and uh he's doing a lot of his own stunt work and uh you know he's got his stunt accreditation in the uk so he's quite renowned in the industry and loves being involved in that sort of thing yeah. and uh he's also promoted well i mean he was verbally promoting his hair piece to me as a, a, a revolutionary thing as well. So if you need hair pieces, talk to Ryan. He knows the one that you should get and the treatment plans that you should use. Is that like if you're going bald? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a, a, a wig for men, but <laughs> but like a toupee, but like, yeah. But, it, but the way he explained it, and it looks really good. You have to give him credit. It does look really good, but he said it's not that much of a process to have a full head of hair and you can, you know, get out there and be confident again. So should do it. If, you, if you're going bald, ask Ryan. I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're in what first week of December. You've had a huge year, um, a lot of growth. What's twenty twenty looking like for you at the moment? Uh, twenty twenty, I guess now is I've been like spending the last three years really just following passion full time. Where it's like, okay, I'm just gonna do what I like, just gonna push myself out there and have the best time doing it. And I haven't really been focusing on the external business side of things or even any way of giving back uh, to myself as in feeding myself on a table in a fiscal way. So uh, I guess it's kind of looking for endorsements, looking for ways that I can uh, represent brands and bring back some sort of credibility to... Uh, one second. Yeah. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't been doing that outside of that. So hope, yeah, there yeah. we go. So bringing back credibility to these uh, so bring credibility to these brands in a way that you know my audience or uh, movement audience or somebody who's interested in parkour can find th cool things that they want to work with or purchase or have in their own everyday life yeah I mean that's something we've talked about a little bit and we'll continue to talk about is like the monetization of the sport and I just feel like you know when there's people doing it at the level that you're doing it now and you know you've dedicated like so much of your life to the sport it still seems to be like coming in from like a digital marketing standpoint you know there's some some ways that money can be made but they still seem a little bit like I don't know it's like selling out or something like that you know uh, there is this old very old school kind of uh, mentality that it comes from my generation of like trying to make sure that you're as pure to your movement pure to yourself pure to your moral compass as possible or even pure to the moral compass of what people think parkour should be uh you know like an old adage is uh would you would you um sorry we're having some wind problems so yes uh so the old adage of would you would you uh get paid by a cigarette company to promote cigarettes within parkour and it obviously it's very questionable and everyone has a different answer to such a topic but it's one of those things where we have a lot of pressure because a lot of kids are involved in the sport and a lot of health and fitness comes around the sport 
where we have to, you know, Red Bull, when it first came into the sport, was hated by a huge amount of the scene, almost more than people who hated Fig nowadays. Yeah. Um, hated people forget Red about Bull. that. Like, how yeah. I, like, I mean, now... I've seen some of those people at Red Bull competitions as well. <laughs> like, that's the thing is, nowadays, the, the like, I don't, I don't receive nearly the amount of comments of, oh my God, you support this brand or this, this energy drink is there, blah, 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 because the stigma around it has left. And that still, though still creates a subconscious pressure as an athlete to be worried about selling out like you said be worried about in the eyes of your peers who you want the respect from uh being someone who just took the the financial gain and stopped being true to the sport per se Mm -hmm. yeah well there's there's a lot to be talked about there and i mean there's some of the topics i'm bringing up on this podcast anyway Mm. um and yeah i mean you need to make money out of the sport, man. And I, yeah, <laughs> that, that's really what happened with the fig thing. Everyone's like, I hate fig. Oh, wait, I want to make a living by just doing competitions. Yeah. Oh, okay, I guess I'll do fig. And it was really yeah. funny to watch that kind of unfold. Yeah, well, and it seems like, you know, you got your hendos and all those sorts of guys that were competing and, you know, it's it seems to be normalized and the discussion has dropped a little bit. And I feel like as the new year kicks over and the new competitions start again, that sort of anti-fig thing will kick up again. Um, and I, I mean, it's very warranted. I, un- I totally understand. I, yeah, I mean, we're not a branch of gymnastics. That that goes without saying. I just, I don't think that, I think if we are smart as a sport, we would find as a way to digest and normalize it in our own system as opposed to having something where we protest against it and then it just becomes its own conglomerate. Why not try and use parkour and the strength that parkour has to make sure that it goes the right direction instead of just being anti it and then not having any control of where it goes well i mean becoming an opposing force in all things like it never seems to work right and Mm. if anything you are just giving more um like uh building it up like fig until we recognize them as being the imposing force if like yeah if we just had not of played as if we just got involved and sort of the right people got involved and it from day one it got directed in the right way it probably wouldn't have become as big as it was but then instead we took the opposite side we vilified anyone that was involved with it, even if they're our own peers mm. and now it's kind of us versus them yeah. but that gives them credibility yeah because then they, they are the us and yeah. there is the them as opposed to all of us being one hub of parkour and I know that's really hard with something so big like Fig coming in but it also we experience the same thing with Red Bull coming in it's about getting the right people involved so that the right message can be transponded through that channel exactly. obviously you're not going to like ever, like Adidas just released parkour inspired running la- la- like running wear I don't think they've talked to anybody in parkour yeah. but you know what are we going to do start going oh my god look at the Adidas thing and bringing attention around it or are we just going to go okay that's cool that's Adidas cool. has recognised us again yeah, yeah. Parkour's it must mean that the sport's growing yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean yeah. parkour is being a positive effect and hopefully that can lead us then to working with those brands in the future by being open minded and not criticising yeah there's that Nike stuff that's going around at the moment as well with um, the Nike the guys that have made the fight the fake Nike brand. Have you seen that? No. I yeah, seen they're, they're they're printing bootleg shirts of <laughs> Nike, and it's like, like we're gonna bootleg them until they recognise us. And it's kind of funny because they've been doing that, but then at the same time, Adidas, which is almost as big as Nike, has just released a, a parkour collection. Yes. So they kind of have recognised it's just not directly Nike. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is that wider audience and that kind of yeah, pushing yourself out to that those bigger names. What I liked about that was that, in the comments there was very few like oh parkour is like lame why are you doing this there was just like general public being like this is a fucking dope collection yeah so it was almost like wider acceptance of the sport through that as well yeah i mean two years ago i went on uh morning show and they were like yeah you poo catch your pants because they just didn't understand that drop crutch pants were already in trend at that point now i see everyone in the street wearing drop crutch fucking three tassel (laughs) you know tied up at the bottom pants i'm like oh well guess that came around (laughs) all right we're going to jump into the beef of what we want to talk about today and i feel like there's very few people in the parkour community as qualified as you to talk about best spots in the world because (laughs) i don't think many other people have been to as many spots as you have (laughs) have been to a fair few spots i'm not gonna lie so what is dom tomato's top three 
parkour spots in the whole wide world. Let's start with the obvious one, which is IMAX Waterloo in London, England. So Ooh. if you get out at Waterloo Station, you go down underneath the IMAX building to the blue walls that you've probably seen in every video coming out of London for the last 12 years. Yeah, if you don't know about IMAX, then like, go just and stop do your homework. this, stop, <laughs> go to fucking YouTube and you, yeah, type in IMAX parkour and yeah. Yeah, it's, Shame it's, on you. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is the epitome of iconization. is that the right word? I, it's an, an epitome of an iconic spot in parkour. It's a word parkour. now, it's okay. Yeah, so <laughs> basically, for me, that spot, for a number of reasons, is my number one spot in the world. Is One, as I said, there's a huge cultural history behind the spot. So I grew up, when I was 15 to 17, watching every video that came out of England, and they would all meet up at this spot. And so everything for the first three hours of the gem would be done at this amazing spot, which has, in my opinion, a huge variety of level variants to train. So you've got a, ba a basic block where you can learn your real basic stuff, and then the wall gaps are actually at a reasonable distance where you're not having to maximize your jump. So people of a medium level can start pushing themselves in a safe way. The walls are thick, they're not hard corners, so that you can make sure that if you undershoot, that you're safe and you're not slipping off and shinning yourself on walls. And then, of course, you get to the, the massive manly, stuff. The manly jumps. Man, there's, there's some big, big, big jumps to be done at IMAX, and I think, you know, the, because it's such an iconic spot, people always talk about, uh, you know, the jumps that could be done there or potentially done, and... Uh, you know, the, if you see something new or find something new at IMAX, it's almost exciting for all of London and the parkour people in London because everyone is going to go there and be able to relate to how big or how scary or how dangerous or how technically difficult that thing is. Yeah. There was a cool video that was made last year that was like the progression of IMAX. Did you see that at all? No. Yeah. I'd love to see that. And it was like starting from the UF days up until like, I think it was 2017. I think you might have been even been featured in it a couple of times. Um, and it was like the UF guys starting from the start and what they were doing and then every year some footage from that of how mm -hmm. it progressed up until the, the current days where yeah. a few of the boys last early in the year were doing like the big downward precisions you did one yeah and yeah. yeah so if you search that like progression of IMAX on YouTube it's a really cool video mm -hmm. I definitely have to check it out when I get home so IMAX number one number two number two I would say let's bring it back home and uh, the wharf in Sydney so the there's actually three wharf spots in one spot like they're all within a five minute walk of each other and it's just a, a nine to ten foot jump out over water the first one is the probably most iconic one that you guys know which is the star casino wharf mm. and that's the one where i flipped up onto the white yeah, pole yeah, yeah. that one's a more simple structure it's just like one wooden beam very very solid uh it sways a little bit in the water and the reason i like this spot and these spots more than most spots around the world is because it's very hard to find a spot that has a mental challenge, mm. like a good bunch of different uh, jumps, but with a mental challenge that's not deathly. You know what I mean? Like you can go up two stories and start challenging yourself, but the danger factor increases. Like every time you go up a story, you're increasing the danger almost 10 times. Yeah. But if you do it over water, it's the same amount of mental fuckery. Like I don't want to fall in, I don't want to get wet, but you, have the safety ability of being able to fall in and get wet and that's all the sh like but the shame you feel that's really interesting though because i feel like most people get more scared when water's underneath them, which is a bit irrational right you've got something moving right there it's visually i can see i can understand how it might be more distracting but it is weird right because yeah. you, it's it's a sense of like i just don't want to get wet which yeah. becomes this huge fear yeah okay that makes yeah. sense yeah and you've smashed those spots then you basically own the water <laughs> um yeah i mean this year we're hopefully going to be building a little few tops on a few more of the sketchy ones around Piermont and hitting some more challenges so stay tuned for that sick so that's two so number one IMAX Sydney wharf spots number two and the third and number three is more of a dream destination for anybody that gets to go to it and uh, I'm sure any free runner who's been there in the past can tell you 100% this is one of the best spots in the world is Santorini in Greece yeah if you go to Fira or Ia or even uh, what's the other city down in the bottom like basically any of the cities that fulfill that island are made for parkour, are unbelievable, have crazy amounts of challenges. And you don't even have to go on the rooftops in these cities to find those challenges. Like there's buildings and areas that have front structures that will give you endless hours of trainings and variation. And it's just such a cool feeling and vibrant like 
energy when you're training in Santorini. You've got these amazing views. You've got like this crazy white walls that you don't see anywhere else. And the structures are so solid and so perfect that you just feel like you could, like it's, it's parkour heaven. Yeah. You know, Santorini is his parkour heaven. There's not one specific spot there, but the actual island itself. Sweet. All right, let's go bonus one more that people might, might, might throw people off a bit. Somewhere that you've been that's like maybe Okay. Red Bull Project and, or and, uh, something. I've got one. Yeah. Uh, so Munster in Germany has, Munster. has a really good bunch of fun, challenging spots that are like very different and interesting. I think maybe because Endis is one of the my pioneers of their scene there. The type yeah. of spots that they have in the city are very interesting. And there's one specifically which is their home spot. And it's kind of an apartment building which is built down into... Uh, a driveway and a bot- parkway at the bottom, so the stairs that lead to the the parking garage, and up on the top they've got a few platforms and stuff, and it just has a huge variation of like uh, technical, really difficult, small challenges yeah. up into like the biggest, scariest, like literally the scariest front flip I've done is there. Sick. And it's because there's just so many factors and so many different things that make that spot unique and interesting, from level changes to contention of rails and walls and. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, quiet area as well. There we go. That's what I'm after. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking the afternoon off to come and speak to me. Thank you, Saturday, for being patient and walking around the city, city with us. These guys have some really cool projects coming up, some stuff that we can't talk about yet, but keep an eye on. I mean, you, you probably all follow uh, Dom. Uh, I assume that would be the case. And, yeah, there's some cool stuff coming up. Keep your ears out here as well, and hopefully I'll be back soon. Thank you for listening. You. See. So, that one would have been